today we're going to talk about hearsay. We're going to talk about its meaning, its definition, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Actually, there's a lot on our plate, so let's just go ahead and cut straight to the intro. Welcome to Law of Venture. My name is Jarrett Stone. Since you're watching this video about objections, I highly recommend that you download this cheat sheet with the 21 most common trial objections. It's super free, it's super helpful, and it has a breakdown of how to make each objection, when to make each objection, and how to respond to each objection. If you wanna get it, go in the description, click the link, type in your email address, and then boom, it'll get sent directly to you. I also recommend that you check out this video with the top 10 trial objections that you'll be making in the courtroom. It's super helpful and you wanna have these down pat. Okay, enough of that, let's talk about hearsay. And I wanna set expectations just a little bit before diving into a detailed hearsay analysis because this particular video is just gonna be a broad overview, basically a bird's eye view of what all hearsay is and what all hearsay entails. If I were to dive too into the weeds with hearsay and have one super long video, I think I would lose most of y'all and I truthfully wouldn't even watch the video from beginning to end myself. So we're gonna take hearsay in bite-sized chunks. And in order to keep up with all the videos, don't forget to subscribe, which is down there. All right, let's start with 801 because rule 801 defines exactly what hearsay is. And in order to make any analysis about hearsay, you need to know what it is. So let's dive in. According to the Federal Rules of Evidence, Rule 801, hearsay means a statement that the declarant does not make while testifying at the current trial or hearing, and a party offers an evidence to prove the truth of the matter asserted in the statement. Yeah, I know, mind blown a little bit. There's a lot going on in that definition. Fortunately, 801 provides a little bit of guidance because it has additional definitions to define the certain key elements within the hearsay definition. Hopefully that makes sense, but we'll break it down to where it does make a little bit more sense. In particular, let's look at what a statement is under 801. A statement means a person's oral assertion, written assertion, or nonverbal conduct if the person intended it as an assertion. So given that definition, we know that hearsay is going to potentially apply to certain statements, whether it was written, whether it was oral, or nonverbal conduct. Now, nonverbal conduct is a little tricky, but something like that, if you intended it to be a statement of yes or a confirmation, that's a nonverbal conduct. Or if you were to, and here's probably the best example, click the like button down below, that is a nonverbal statement that you are enjoying this video. Now we need to basically unpack the other important element of what hearsay is, and that's the definition of a declarant. A declarant means the person who made the statement. That definition is simple enough. And just a side note, this is kind of unrelated. Every time I hear the word declarant, it makes me think of Michael Scott in the office, always saying, I do declare in that one episode involving a murder investigation. I don't know if that comes to mind for anybody else. If it does, leave that in the comments below. All right, got off topic there. Let's get back on topic. When it comes to the word declarant, there needs to be an important distinction. A declarant isn't synonymous and doesn't mean the same exact thing as witness. A declarant is more often than not, in the hearsay sense, somebody who made a statement outside of the witness stand and outside of the courtroom. This will be important to remember as we proceed in each one of these aspects of hearsay, in particular, the purpose behind hearsay, but I'm gonna go ahead and Hold that back right now because we're still unpacking this definition. But just keep in mind that a witness isn't always a declarant, but you can also have a witness who is also a declarant if that particular witness is quoting a statement that they declared, like Michael Scott, outside of the witness stand. I think that makes sense. I hope it makes sense. If it doesn't, be sure to maybe ask me a follow-up question in the comments below. Okay. The final element that we need to talk about is the truth of the matter asserted in that hearsay definition. Now, what does that mean? And that's kind of a really weird way to phrase any sentence, but the truth of the matter asserted simply means that you're offering a sentence up or a statement and you're trying to prove the substance of that particular statement. So if I were to offer up a statement that Bob told me today is Cinco de Mayo. Well, if I'm offering it to prove the fact that today is Cinco de Mayo 
or that particular day was Cinco de Mayo, something along those lines, then I'm trying to prove using the substance of that sentence, the same exact fact. That means I'm trying to prove the truth of the matter asserted. Now on the opposite side, what wouldn't be the truth of the matter asserted is if I maybe offered the Cinco de Mayo statement that Bob made, the declarant, then if I offered that for the just pure purpose of showing that I spoke with Bob that particular day, then that means I'm not trying to prove that it was Cinco de Mayo. I'm just trying to prove that I had a communication and I had a conversation with Bob. So in that particular instance, it's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. And in that particular instance, that statement by a declarant out of court potentially would be non-hearsay. And that's the second part of 801. 801D goes into greater detail of what non-hearsay actually is. But there's an important distinction that needs to be made. Non-hearsay is not the same as a hearsay exception. This is so critical and so many lawyers get this confused. They refer to everything as a hearsay exception. Non-hearsay has never been hearsay at any point because by definition, it's not hearsay. That's an important distinction because whenever you make this argument to the judge, that means that at no point in time should this have been prevented from being into evidence. On the flip side, if you have a hearsay exception on its face, before you get to the exception, that particular statement should not be admitted because it's hearsay. Then you have to apply an exception. So you have a harder road whenever you're arguing that it's a hearsay exception. And it's just, it's just an unreasonably harder road if you're arguing it's an exception when in reality, it's non-hearsay. So be sure you have that correct. Be sure it's crystal clear to the judge that if it's non-hearsay, it was never hearsay to begin with. So many lawyers, like I said, get this confused and it's easy to get confused, but let's go ahead and just move on to 802. And 802 makes it a little bit clear about why we're talking about hearsay. 802 states that hearsay is not admissible unless any of the following provides otherwise a federal statute, these rules, or other rules prescribed by the Supreme Court. That definition shouldn't come to a surprise to you given everything we've been talking about when it comes to keeping statements out of evidence. But I hope you have a certain question in your mind, which is, why do we have this rule against hearsay? What is it all about? Well, truthfully, it's not to make your life miserable. There's actually a real purpose behind it. But before answering that, we need to talk about cross-examination. The purpose of cross-examination is to stress test the other side's witnesses and the other side's position. That way the jury can determine whether or not the witness and the other side's position is credible. And so this allows the opposing side to, during cross-examination, poke holes. And if the witness survives the cross-examination and the jury thinks the witness did a great job, then most likely that witness will be deemed credible. Now, the issue and the complication occurs with hearsay. Let's say I'm cross-examining a witness and at some point during that cross-examination, the witness decides to quote a declarant and is using this statement or this quote to prove the truth of the matter asserted. And let's go ahead and rule out that this is not non-hearsay. So it is hearsay, double negative there. And the problem I have at this point, the wrench in my plan with my cross-examination is that I can't cross-examine the declarant because the declarant isn't on the stand. So I can't really stress test the credibility of the declarant and the credibility of the statement made by the declarant. I just said declarant a whole lot. And that's why we have the hearsay objection. But here's a little bit of a caveat. The hearsay objection, like we've talked about, has exceptions. So let's talk about those. Rule 803 and 804 are the exceptions to hearsay. There's an important distinction between the two to where, and I'll just gloss over this because this is just a highlight video basically. 803 is going to apply in all cases essentially when it comes to the exceptions. 804 is only going to apply in certain situations, mainly whenever the declarant is unavailable to be a witness for certain reasons. So be sure to check those out. I'll have videos that explain this a little bit in greater detail, but there's one important concept that I want you to understand with these exceptions. Generally speaking, the hearsay exceptions assume that the facts that apply to each exception is made because it's true. And to make that a little bit more concrete, let's go ahead and use an example. Under 803, there's excited utterance. And in that situation, if something shocking happens and in the moment, a declarant says something 
and doesn't have time to really think about it, just reacts by saying something, that statement is essentially assumed to be truthful because under the excited utterance exception, the declarant doesn't have enough time to really formulate that statement and be strategic to where, okay, maybe this statement may be used in a court of law, so I wanna say it exactly that's gonna be most beneficial to me or my friend or to whoever. But with excited utterance in particular, it assumes it's true because somebody didn't really have time in the moment to think that far ahead. And that's essentially the same principle, not so much as like excited utterance, but the same principle of honesty and truthfulness with most of these exceptions. So be sure to unpack it, be sure to go through each one and see if certain statements apply or don't apply. And remember, there's a distinction between non-hearsay and exceptions. You always need to keep in mind that even though something may be non-hearsay or even though something may satisfy a hearsay exception, it's always going to have to satisfy rule 403 before it's admitted. So if you're trying to get a statement in, keep in mind you have to overcome rule 403, or if you're trying to object, remember, always have that catch-all 403 objection. If you are needing more material about 403, be sure to watch this video above that I released. It goes into detail and really unpacks 403 for you. All right, let's move on to the next aspect of the hearsay objection. Sorry if my eyes are watering, I just sneezed off camera. Anyways, we're not gonna spend too much time on 805 because it's really not that complicated. It basically says that you can have hearsay within hearsay. And if that's the case, then you're going to need to unpack each level of hearsay with an exception. And it's a lot like inception to where you just keep going one layer deep. But the point of it is, let's say you have a document with statements on it, a writing, that's potentially hearsay. And within that document, if the person quotes somebody else, if there's a declarant, then you could have that multi-level of hearsay. So you're gonna have to find an exception for the first one, an exception for the second one. And then again, you're gonna have to satisfy rule 403. Okay, moving on to the next one, 806. 806 is relatively short because it allows you to attack or support the credibility of a declarant. And this kind of brings us full circle with the whole point of cross-examination, which is stress testing the credibility of a witness. But in this particular case, you're either stress testing or supporting the credibility of a declarant who isn't a witness. All right, let's just move on to 807. This one's also short and simple, and it really appeals to a sense of fairness. And this is kind of the catch-all for the hearsay exception. It's not the 403, the ultimate catch-all, but it's the last stand when it comes to allowing a hearsay statement to come in. And truthfully, I don't know how often people are successful making this argument, but it's something you need to have in your back pocket just in case. Be sure to check out the elements, be sure to satisfy all the elements, and be sure to note that there is a notice requirement that you need to satisfy as well. If you can make a good argument, fingers crossed, hopefully the judge will let the statement in. All right, if you have any questions about this, be sure to leave those in the comments below. And if you're still watching at this point, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. Hey, the subscribe button, it's over there. It's, it's right there, right there. All right, I'll see y'all in the next video.